Welcome to part eight of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore dark and fascinating mysteries. On this iceberg, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, myths and legends, strange events, cryptids, urban legends, and more. Now join me for a trip down the rabbit hole. Tara Calico. On the morning of September 20th, 1988, 19-year-old Tara Calico left her home in Valencia County, New Mexico for her usual bike ride along State Road 47. She never returned, sparking an investigation that has spanned years without conclusive results. Tara's disappearance was marked by the eerie find of a Polaroid photo in Port St. Joe, Florida in 1989, showing a young woman and boy bound and gagged. This photo propelled the case into the national spotlight, with speculation that the woman in the image was Tara. Despite analysis by various agencies, including the FBI, Scotland Yard, and the Los Alamos National Laboratory, the identity of the individuals in the photograph remains a subject of debate. Tara's mother was convinced the girl in the photo was her daughter, citing a leg scar and a book visible in the image as evidence. The boy was initially thought to be Michael Henley, a boy who disappeared in New Mexico. However, he was later found dead and foul play was ruled out, debunking theories that he was the boy in the photo. This photograph has kept Tara Calico's disappearance from falling off the radar for decades. Theories about Tara's disappearance have varied, from her being hit by a truck and subsequently slain to a possible kidnapping. In 2008, a sheriff claimed to have information on two teenagers who might have accidentally hit Tara with their truck, leading to her death. This theory, however, lacked sufficient evidence for arrests, given the lack of a body. The two boys indicated that they had accidentally struck her with their truck while they were driving, and rather than helping her, they ended her. In June 2023, the sheriff's department advised that they had submitted evidence to the district attorney to review for any potential charges. However, due to the seriousness of the allegations, the identity of the accused is currently sealed. As of February 2024, charges have not yet been laid at this point. Further, advancements in facial recognition software may be able to say with increasing confidence whether the girl in the Polaroid is Tara Calico. Wallace Thrasher. Wallace Thrasher led a life that reads like a script from a Hollywood crime thriller. Born and raised in the New River Valley, Thrasher was no stranger to the adrenaline pumping life of drug smuggling. His early years included stints in the Navy, modeling, and even enduring a Mexican prison due to drug charges. Thrasher's life took a darker turn with his involvement in smuggling operations that saw him transporting massive quantities of marijuana into the United States, using Virginia's remote mountainous regions as his delivery destination. Thrasher's criminal activities came to the attention of the authorities in October 1984, when a plane registered to him crashed into a mountainside near Fancy Gap, Virginia. This crash revealed over 1,200 pounds of the devil's lettuce and a body was found inside. However, upon further investigation, this was not Thrasher's body, but a pilot he hired to help as a part of his operations. But just as the investigation into Thrasher heated up, a strange event occurred. Wallace Thrasher allegedly died in a plane crash in Jamaica on November 5th, 1984. Curiously, at the funeral for Wallace Thrasher, guests were officially told that he perished in Puerto Rico, while others were informed privately that he passed away in Central America. His wife produced a death certificate and gave it to the authorities, who were suspicious of the document, and quickly found the death certificate was a forgery. Further, the U.S. authorities contacted the Jamaican authorities, who had no record whatsoever of any such crash. Thrasher's wife later agreed to work with the authorities to bring down Thrasher's drug empire. After she agreed to cooperate, she advised the authorities of the story she was told by Thrasher's criminal associates. 
she was told that Thrasher took a large amount of cash to Belize. While in Belize, he boarded another plane for parts unknown. However, his associates advised that his plane really crashed that time just after takeoff and that he had perished. In a conversation which I imagine was something like the famous steamed ham scene between Principal Skinner and Superintendent Chalmers, the associate came up with a rather unique story. In an attempt to explain away this obvious lie, he said that she couldn't see the crash site or the debris because the fire was so bad that they just bulldozed the plane into a hole. To confirm that her husband was dead, the associate went to the site after the alleged bulldozing incident. Surprisingly, despite the supposed complete and utter destruction of the plane, the associate found Thrasher's wedding ring at the site, confirming that he must have been on board. There have been no confirmed sightings of Wallace since 1984. The authorities dropped all charges against Wallace in 2015, and the statute of limitations on his crimes has expired. So if he was on the lam, he's been free to return to the United States since then. However, he has never returned despite having a family eagerly awaiting his return, if he is alive. There are a number of different theories as to what happened to Wallace Thrasher. One of the detectives investigating the case believes that he faked his death and assumed a new identity. He cites Thrasher's high intelligence and his previous use of false identities as evidence for this theory. Another theory is that he fled to Belize as his wife was advised. However, upon arrival with a large sum of drug loot, he was slain by his associates who made up a plane crash to cover up their crime. The final theory, supported by Wallace Thrasher's wife and family, is that he did indeed perish in the Belize plane crash. Evidence in favor of this theory is that Wallace Thrasher was a doting father and husband despite his criminal lifestyle. They don't believe he wouldn't have attempted to contact them in the decades following his disappearance. The Dancing Plague of 1518. In July 1518, Strasbourg, then located in the Holy Roman Empire, though now part of modern-day France, became the epicenter of the Dancing Plague of 1518. It began with a woman named Frau Trophea, who stepped out of her house and began to dance fervently in the streets. Her solitary performance rapidly evolved into a mass hysteria, with up to 400 people joining in. This event wasn't just a spontaneous communal dance, but an uncontrollable and often painful ordeal that lasted until September 1518. Individuals caught up in the plague experienced exhaustion and injuries. Further, some are reported to have died from the sheer physical toll of the endless dancing. The cause of this bizarre episode has puzzled historians and scientists for centuries. Initial theories ranged from spiritual and supernatural explanations, such as a curse from St. Vitus, to medical conditions like ergot poisoning, the poisoning from consuming rye bread infected with a toxic fungus. However, the ergotism theory has been largely dismissed due to the physical impossibility for those affected by the toxin to dance for extended periods. A more plausible explanation points towards stress-induced mass hysteria or psychogenic movement disorder. The region was suffering from extreme hardship, including famine and diseases, which might have contributed to a collective psychological crisis. This kind of mass psychogenic illness could manifest in bizarre behavior, such as the uncontrollable dancing seen in Strasbourg. Similar incidents had occurred in the same region during the medieval era, indicating a potential susceptibility to such psychological phenomena among the populace. The Disappearance of Jason Jolkowski. Jason Jolkowski, a 19-year-old from Omaha, Nebraska, vanished on June 13, 2001, under mysterious circumstances that remain unresolved. Born on June 24, 1981, in Grand Island, Nebraska, Jason was a part-time student in a radio broadcasting program at Iowa Western Community College. He was also employed at a local restaurant and aspired to become a local radio DJ. 
The day of his disappearance, Jason was called into work early. His car was in the shop, so he arranged to meet a co-worker at Benson High School, his former school, for a ride. A neighbor saw him taking out the trash at around 10.45 a.m., but by 11.30 a.m., when his co-worker called his home, Jason had not arrived at the school as planned. Security footage from the school later confirmed he never made it there. Jason left behind a bank account with $650 untouched and several uncashed paychecks. He had been looking forward to starting a new job the following week, making his sudden disappearance out of character and leading his family to suspect foul play. Despite extensive investigations, no trace of Jason has been found. In the aftermath, his parents founded Project Jason, a nonprofit organization aiding families of missing persons. Out of this tragedy, they successfully campaigned for the creation of Jason's Law in Nebraska, establishing a statewide missing persons database, undoubtedly leading to the saving of many lives. Sadly, Jason himself has still yet to be found. However, the Omaha police continue to actively investigate the case, leading to hope that there will one day be justice for Jason, or at the very least, some closure for his family. The Disappearance of Tara Breckenridge On August 4, 1992, Tara Suzette Breckenridge, a 23-year-old waitress at the men's club in Houston, Texas, disappeared under mysterious circumstances. She was last seen leaving her workplace at around 1 a.m., following a decision by management to send home two servers early due to a slow night. Tara volunteered to leave, which was considered out of character for her. A security guard escorted her to her car, marking the last time she was confirmed to have been seen. Her vehicle, a red 1986 Pontiac Fiero, was found abandoned and locked on her route home, with no signs of a struggle but the alternator belt missing. Inside the car, a can of mace Breckenridge carried for protection was discovered unused. The disappearance of Breckenridge has left many unanswered questions, with her boyfriend at the time, Wayne Hecker, being a person of interest. The relationship between Breckenridge and Hecker was reportedly troubled, with Breckenridge having expressed intentions of leaving him. On the night of her disappearance, Hecker claimed to be at a pool hall. Her vehicle was located only a few minutes from the establishment, and individuals at the pool hall who were interviewed noted that he was absent from 1.45 a.m. to 3.30 a.m. Despite his assertions of innocence and lack of physical evidence linking him to the crime, suspicions have lingered due to the couple's rocky relationship and inconsistencies in Hecker's timeline. There have been no alleged sightings of Tara since she disappeared. One popular theory alleges that the boyfriend may have played a role in her disappearance. However, no evidence whatsoever has been found to link him to the disappearance, and he has never been charged in relation to the disappearance. Another theory suggests that her disappearance was related to her work as a waitress at the Gentleman's Club. Under this theory, she may have had a stalker amongst the patrons, or one of the patrons may have opportunistically committed a violent act against her. Supporting this theory is the fact that the club had extensive security and she felt the need to carry mace to protect her from some of the more unsavory patrons. If you're enjoying this video, please do me a huge favor and hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell. My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you along for the ride. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. Have you seen this man in your dreams? The This Man phenomenon began circulating online in 2009 when a website claimed people around the world were dreaming of the same face, despite never having met the man. This mysterious figure, depicted in a sketch, was said to appear in diverse dream scenarios, offering advice, comfort, or simply appearing in various contexts. The website, thisman.org, invited those who had seen the man in their dreams to share their experiences, 
contributing to the lore surrounding him. Internet users were fascinated by the man's appearance, with some suggesting that he falls into the quote-unquote uncanny valley. Also, quick aside, we're going to be exploring why the uncanny valley exists later in this video. The intrigue and speculation about the nature of this man ranged from psychological explanations to supernatural theories. Some posited he was a manifestation of the collective unconscious, while others thought of him as a spiritual entity or even a real person capable of dream surfing. However, the backstory of this man reveals a seemingly more grounded reality. Andre Natella, an Italian marketer and sociologist, later admitted to creating the This Man story as a marketing stunt. The website and the character were part of a guerrilla marketing campaign, a fact that was unveiled when internet sleuths connected the website to Nutella's unconventional marketing firm. Despite this revelation, the story of this man had already captivated the imagination of many, with many people purporting having seen this man in their dreams. The Atlanta Ripper In the early 20th century, Atlanta, Georgia, was terrorized by a series of brutal slayings that bore a chilling resemblance to those committed by Jack the Ripper in London. Between 1911 and 1915, at least 20 African-American women were slain with a shocking level of violence. Despite the horrifying nature of these crimes, the Atlanta Ripper, as the perpetrator came to be known, was never caught. The first recognized victim of the Atlanta Ripper was Mary Bell Walker, whose body was discovered in 1911 with a deep cut across her throat. The subsequent slayings followed a similarly gruesome pattern, with many victims having their throats slashed and further desecrations committed. Reports of these killings were sensationalized and highlighted the killer's brutal methods. However, the Atlanta Ripper's crimes and stagings of the scenes were as horrific as reported. Sadly, investigations into these murders were severely hampered by the era's social dynamics and the limited resources allocated to the African-American community's safety. Despite several arrests, no one was conclusively proven to be the murderer, and the killings eventually ceased without resolution. Some theorize that the Atlanta Ripper wasn't an actual serial killer, but rather several unconnected or copycat slayings. According to this theory, the lack of police attention to the slaying of these women encouraged others to commit heinous acts against the city's African-American population. Given the passage of time and the lack of proper investigation and evidence collection at the time of the slayings, this mystery will likely remain forever unsolved. Elysian Park Treasure In the heart of modern Los Angeles lies Elysian Park, a site shrouded in tales of buried treasure. During the tumultuous period of the Mexican-American War in 1846, Los Angeles was a sparse settlement, with a population of a few thousand people at most. As the war loomed, wealthy residents fearing the seizure of their fortunes by advancing U.S. troops, buried their fortunes in what is now Elysian Park. One notable tale involves Francisco Avila, a wealthy cattle rancher and landowner, who is said to have buried an extremely large quantity of coin and jewels within the park's canyons to protect it from American soldiers. Unfortunately, according to the story, Avila died shortly after and despite knowledge of the treasure's existence, it was never located. Over the years, the legend persisted, with various individuals and treasure hunters attempting to locate Avila's lost wealth. Other less famous rumored caches hidden during the war by families seeking to safeguard their assets were also sought out by fortune seekers. The allure of these treasures has drawn countless individuals to Elysian Park, armed with metal detectors and hopes of discovering lost fortunes. Despite such efforts, and even though curious markings and tunnels have been found, no significant treasures have been unearthed. 
present day laws prohibit digging in the park without a permit, adding a layer of complexity to treasure hunting endeavors. However, the legend persists. I suspect that wealthy Los Angeles residents did indeed hide their fortunes in the face of an advancing army. There's absolutely nothing unusual about this. However, upon further research, the battle referred to by this legend, known as the Siege of Los Angeles, was actually won by the Mexican forces, not the American forces. American forces never held Los Angeles prior to the annexation of California, nearly two years after the siege. Further, the death toll of the siege of Los Angeles was, to put it simply, non-existent. There were no reported civilian or military causalities of any kind whatsoever on either side. My theory is as follows. The wealthy residents of Los Angeles did indeed hide their fortunes in the face of the advancing Americans. However, when the siege broke, the Mexican residents of Los Angeles simply gathered their hidden wealth and returned it to their homes. In the alternative, or in conjunction with the above theory, any individual who discovered caches of treasure is unlikely to publicize the fact. Publicizing the finding of large amounts of treasure has its obvious problems, from taxes to descendants coming out of the woodwork to challenge ownership of the treasure. The Identity of Banksy Banksy, a street artist who has achieved worldwide renown, remains a mystery despite this global fame. His identity is a closely guarded secret, protected by a combination of anonymity, speculation, and the occasional red herring. The intrigue surrounding Banksy not only adds to the allure of his work, but also serves as a protective measure, considering much of his public art is technically illegal. Speculation about Banksy's identity is rampant, with numerous theories circulating. Few facts are known for certain. However, he is confirmed to be a white male likely born in the 1970s. One of the most persistent names linked to Banksy is Robin Gunningham. This theory gained further traction when a DJ referred to Banksy as Rob in a podcast, potentially referencing Robin Gunningham. Other theories have suggested Banksy could be Robert Del Naja, also known as 3D a member of the band Massive Attack, or even the collective effort of a group of artists. Del Naja, a personal friend of Banksy and a former graffiti artist himself, has been linked to the mystery due to coincidences in the timing and locations of Massive Attack's tours and the appearance of Banksy's art. However, given that Del Naja may be a friend of Banksy, the coincidence could be explained by the two men meeting up where Del Naja was performing. More out there, theories propose that the man behind the popular Art Attack series was Banksy. However, there appears to be no evidence for this claim. Further, some speculate that Banksy isn't one single person, but rather a collective of street artists originating out of Bristol. The evidence seems to strongly point to Robin Gunningham and scratching the surface of Robin Gunningham's personal history indicates why an admission may never be forthcoming. The themes of Banksy's work stand in stark contrast with Gunningham's upbringing. Gunningham grew up wealthy and attended an elite public school, an upbringing that stands in stark contrast to his anti-capitalist, egalitarian social messaging. Further, Banksy has grown enormously wealthy off his work, which again serves to diminish the credibility of his message in some circles. The Disappearance of Sidney West In the early morning hours of September 30th, 2020, the bustling city of San Francisco became the focal point of a bright young woman's disappearance. Sidney West, a 19-year-old student from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who had recently embarked on her journey at the University of California, Berkeley, vanished without a trace. Her last known whereabouts were near the iconic Golden Gate Bridge, a site that, on that fog-laden morning, 
would become the center of a mystery that continues to perplex her family, investigators, and the public at large. Sydney's transition to college life was fraught with challenges. Prior to her disappearance, she had sustained a concussion, which coupled with the isolation brought on by the 2020 event and the shift to virtual classes proved difficult. Given these issues, she decided to defer her classes to wait for normalcy to return to her personal life and the world. Despite these hurdles, Sydney chose to remain in California with plans to restart her college career in the fall of 2021. Conversations with her family on the eve of her disappearance gave no indication of the tragedy that was to unfold. The morning she disappeared, Sydney was dropped off near the Golden Gate Bridge by a ride-sharing service. The dense fog that morning rendered video footage from the area nearly useless, complicating efforts to trace her movements. Despite extensive searches and investigations, no conclusive evidence has emerged regarding her fate. The ride-sharing driver was cleared of any involvement, and Sydney's backpack and laptop were eventually recovered, though her cell phone remains missing. Notably, there has been no activity on her phone, bank account, credit card, or social media profiles since her disappearance. Given the location that she was dropped off, some have hypothesized that she ended herself. However, the private investigator hired by the family has challenged this notion. The private investigator noted the absence of witness reports or 911 calls that would typically accompany such an event on the bridge. Further, the bridge was bustling with activity that morning, yet no one reported seeing Sydney in distress. However, as discussed, even so, given the heavy fog, the activities of Sydney could have been obscured. At present, Sydney West's whereabouts remain entirely unknown. In my research for this, I ended up reading some interviews with Kimberly and Jay West, Sydney's parents. They thankfully have remained extremely involved in the case and are advocating for their daughter at every step. As of February 2024, Sydney's whereabouts remain unknown. There have been many recent cases of people who disappeared for years, only to re-emerge safe and sound. Let's hope Sydney will be one of these cases. Edward Leeds Kalnan's Coral Castle. Coral Castle, located in Homestead, Florida, is one of the most intriguing structures ever built. The man behind this marvel, Edward Leeds Kalnan, was a Latvian immigrant who single-handedly created the castle from over 1,100 tons of limestone. But what makes this feat even more extraordinary is that it was accomplished without the use of modern machinery. However, many accounts of Coral Castle erroneously indicate that Leeds Kalnan used virtually no tools. This is not accurate. Leeds Kalnan, by his own admission, made extensive use of pre-modern machinery. Born in Latvia in 1887, Leeds Kalnan moved to the United States after a break with his fiancée. This heartbreak was the catalyst for what would become Coral Castle. Starting in 1923, Leeds Kalnan worked on this monumental project until his death in 1951. The construction of Coral Castle is shrouded in mystery. Leeds Kalnan, a small man of just over five feet tall and weighing barely 100 pounds, worked alone, often at night, to move and carve massive stones. Some of the stones used in the castle weigh several tons, with the largest stone estimated to weigh as much as 30 tons. The methods Leeds Kalnan used to manipulate these stones remain a topic of speculation. He claimed to understand the laws of weight and leverage well, suggesting he applied principles of physics that allowed him to single-handedly move and sculpt these massive stones. Coral Castle's construction has sparked numerous alternative and paranormal explanations. Edward Leedskalnan's secretive methods and the seemingly impossible feat of moving massive stones single-handedly has bolstered these beliefs. Some far-out theories suggest that Leedskalnan possessed knowledge of ancient or lost technology 
possibly related to the construction techniques of Stonehenge or the pyramids. Others speculate about the use of magnetic fields and levitation, inspired by Leeds Kalman's own writings on magnetic currents. Leeds Kalman deliberately created an air of mystique surrounding the Coral Castle, which still exists till this day. The Bigfoot Killer. From February to October 1975, a harrowing series of crimes unfolded that would leave an indelible mark on Detroit. The perpetrator, dubbed the Bigfoot Killer, an unidentified assailant, embarked on a brutal campaign of violence, targeting young women engaged in paid companionship. This serial killer, whose moniker was derived from his notably large feet, was responsible for the S.A. and slaying of seven victims, their ages ranging from 16 to 22 years. The Bigfoot killer's modus operandi was chillingly methodical. He preyed upon vulnerable women, luring them with the promise of money in exchange for services. Once they were in his grasp, he would resort to violence, wielding a knife to intimidate and control his victims before committing unspeakable acts, and finally, strangulation. Witnesses and surviving victims described the perpetrator as a muscular, tall African-American man, aged between 30 and 35, with distinctive facial hair and an afro. The investigation into these heinous crimes was fraught with challenges. A key suspect emerged in January 1976 when Carl Mayweather Jr., a 29-year-old Detroit man was arrested during an attempted crime against a woman. Mayweather had a prior record of assault and seemed to fit the physical description of the Bigfoot killer. Despite these initial suspicions, Mayweather was ultimately cleared of involvement in the Bigfoot killings, as he had solid alibis for virtually all of the slayings. The community's response to the killings was one of outrage and desperation. Activists and residents, frustrated with what they perceived as police negligence, organized rallies demanding action and accountability. Their criticisms centered on the authorities' reluctance to acknowledge the severity of the situation and their failure to protect the community's most vulnerable members. Further, they criticized the extreme lack of resources which were assigned to the case. Padre Pio Padre Pio, a Capuchin friar, has been a figure of intrigue and reverence due to his reputed spiritual gifts and miracles. Born on May 25, 1887, in Pietrelcina, Italy, Pio spent much of his life in San Giovanni Rotondo, where he became renowned for bearing the stigmata, wounds mirroring those of Christ, among other mystical phenomena. Despite scrutiny and initial skepticism from the Vatican, Padre Pio was canonized as a saint in 2002 by Pope John Paul II, a testament to his lasting impact on devout Catholics. Padre Pio's life was marked by numerous reported miracles and acts of intercession. Among these, his ability to bilocate or appear in two places simultaneously, and his reception of the stigmata in 1918, stand out. In terms of more earthly accomplishments, he founded a research hospital in Vatican City, which is still operational today and is very highly regarded. The supernatural phenomena attracted attention and devotion, as well as controversy and investigation by skeptics within the church. Church authorities were initially extremely unwilling to accept the extraordinary claims made by Padre Pio. The miracles attributed to Padre Pio are varied, though most of the miracles surround his ability to intercede on behalf of sick and injured individuals. Critics and skeptics have offered various theories to explain Padre Pio's abilities, from fraud and self-infliction of his wounds to psychological phenomena. However, for many believers, these theories fall short of explaining the depth and breadth of Padre Pio's spiritual experiences and the tangible effects of his intercessions. For the faithful, his life and works are seen as a testament to the power of faith and the reality of mystical experiences within the Catholic Church. 
regardless of whether Padre Pio could actually intercede and heal the sick. The belief by the faithful that Padre Pio had the power to convince the creator of the universe to improve your bleak situation undoubtedly led to much more positive outcomes for the sick. Further, while some have questioned his motives, there's no evidence whatsoever that he received any secondary gain from his activities. Given his extreme levels of fame and notoriety in his lifetime, he could have quote unquote, had it all. However, as a member of a monastic order, he voluntarily chose to live a life of asceticism and continued to live a simple lifestyle despite his sheer level of influence. The Pharmacy Maniac. In 2011, Chelyabinsk, Russia, became the backdrop for a chilling series of crimes by an individual dubbed the Pharmacy Maniac. This unidentified assailant targeted two pharmacies within the city, leading to the loss of two lives under harrowing circumstances. The first incident occurred in May, inside a pharmacy where the perpetrator, masked and armed, demanded money from the people present resulting in the fatal shooting of a 49-year-old man named Vladimir Shin, who had walked in to purchase medicine. A few months later, in August, a second attack unfolded in a similar fashion, claiming the life of 30-year-old Igor Ustinov. This time, the attacker shot Ustinov upon entering, and after a brief exit to reload his weapon, returned to ensure Ustinov was deceased. The killer's modus operandi involved the use of a sawn-off shotgun and attacks exclusively on classic brand pharmacies. Witnesses described the assailant as extremely unusual in appearance and odd in demeanor. Further, adding to the mystery, he used Russian phrases generally used by American soldiers in Russian films. Despite intensive investigations, which included the distribution of a facial composite, and a large financial reward for information leading to his capture, the pharmacy maniac remains at large. The perpetrator's motive remains unknown, though he did engage in robberies. However, the robberies were for nominal sums of money, suggesting that robbery was not the primary motive behind the slayings. The Bunyip is a cryptid emerging from Australian Aboriginal folklore originating from a word with meanings akin to demon or evil spirit the bunyip has been a central figure of terror and mystery within the australian interiors swamps and lagoons called billabongs by the locals descriptions of the bunyip vary widely with some depicting it as a large amphibious animal with a blend of features from various animals including a round head and an elongated neck Others portray it as an alien-type creature. This creature's vocalizations, often described as booming or roaring, have cemented its place in the lore as a harbinger of fear and death. The creature's historical accounts are as varied as its descriptions. Early settler narratives and Aboriginal stories tell of a creature lurking in the murky depths, waiting to prey on the unsuspecting. However, Concrete evidence of this cryptid's existence remains elusive, leading to widespread speculation and debate as to what this creature represents. Theories about the origins have evolved over time, with some researchers proposing that the creature might be a distant cultural memory of now extinct animals such as the Diprotodon or the Zygomaturus. The Diprotodon and the Zygomaturus are two gigantic marsupials who are thought to have gone extinct around the time of the arrival of humans in Australia 40,000 years ago. Others propose that they represent a relict population of these creatures, though there's no evidence that they continued on existing. Another popular theory suggests that a seal species that occasionally venture into river systems could be responsible for the sightings. Evidence in favor of this include the loud howling and barking associated with both creatures. The Jersey Devil The Jersey Devil, formerly commonly known as the Leeds Devil, is a cryptid said to inhabit the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Its origins trace back to the 17th century, when English Quakers settled in southern New Jersey, 
where the Pine Barrens are located. The story begins with Daniel Leeds, a Quaker ostracized by his community for his interest in astrology and Christian occultism, leading to his depiction as evil and an associate of the devil. This reputation, compounded by his family's crest, featuring a wyvern, a dragon-like creature, set the stage for the legend of the Leeds Devil, or Jersey Devil, as it came to be known. By the 18th and 19th centuries, the Leeds Devil had become an entrenched part of southern New Jersey folklore, with the figure of a monstrous creature roaming the Pine Barrens. This narrative was further popularized and embellished with various origin stories over time, including the infamous tale of Mother Leeds. According to legend, Mother Leeds cursed her 13th child to be the devil, who then transformed into a monstrous creature and flew away into the Pine Barrens. This creature, described as having bat-like wings, a horse's head, and a forked tail, became synonymous with the Jersey Devil. The legend persisted and evolved, with sightings and encounters reported through the centuries. The creature was said to terrorize local communities, livestock, and travelers, leading to widespread fear and fascination. The most notable period of public hysteria occurred in 1909, when a series of sightings and strange footprints across New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware captured the public's imagination. Newspapers at the time reported on and embellished these incidents, further cementing the Jersey Devil's status in American folklore. The most famous depiction of the Jersey Devil, on screen right now, dates to a newspaper article during the 1909 Jersey Devil mania. Over the years, various explanations have been proposed to rationalize the sightings, ranging from misidentified animals to mass hysteria. My view is that a significant number of modern day Jersey Devil sightings can be attributed to quote unquote owl misidentifications. I've mentioned it before, but people seriously underestimate the size and ferocity of an enraged owl. Imagine for a second you're in the woods in the dead of night and you're assaulted by a huge screeching creature who can fly through dense brush in extreme low light situations. Then overlay the local legend of the Jersey Devil and you will see how the legend continues to spread. Socrates. The question of whether Socrates was an actual historical figure or merely a literary device invented by his students, particularly Plato, has intrigued scholars and enthusiasts of ancient philosophy. This touches on the very foundation of Western philosophical thought. Socrates, as we know him, is primarily depicted through the writings of Plato and, to a lesser extent, Xenophon. These accounts present Socrates as a singular figure in Athens, known for his distinctive method of inquiry, now called the Socratic method. This method involved asking probing questions to expose contradictions in one's thoughts, aiming at clarity and ethical living. However, the absence of writings by Socrates himself complicates the matter, relying instead on his students' portrayals. Could Plato have used Socrates as a character through which to explore his own philosophical ideas? Proponents of this theory suggest that Plato crafted a compelling and consistent character to serve as a mouthpiece for his philosophical investigations. On the other hand, defenders of Socrates' historicity point to the broader historical context and external references to his existence. Aristophanes, a contemporary playwright, caricatured Socrates in his comedy, The Clouds, depicting him as a sophist and natural philosopher. This portrayal, while unflattering and satirical, nonetheless indicates that Socrates was a well-known figure in Athens, distinct enough to be the subject of public satire. Or to put it in distinctly modern terms, this evidence for Socrates' historicity can be summed up in the modern phrase you haven't made it till you've got haters. Moreover, the philosophical impact of Socrates extends beyond Plato and Xenophon. 
Aristotle, who studied at Plato's Academy, refers to Socrates and critiques some of his ideas, suggesting a recognition of Socrates as a historical figure whose teachings were distinct from those of Plato. This indirect evidence from Aristotle further supports the argument for Socrates' historical existence. Further, as anyone who has studied ancient history deeply knows, the quote-unquote evidence for most historical figures is sparse and pieced together from primary and secondary sources, which have been filtered through millennia of copying. Further, the secondary sources virtually always reference or appear to reference numerous primary sources which are lost to time. In my view, Socrates was almost certainly a real person. He is well attested from multiple ancient sources and circumstantial evidence supports his historicity. Further, his lack of writings isn't a knock against him for two reasons. First, no one had ever claimed that Socrates was a prolific writer. Instead, he was a prolific teacher. Given that he was primarily a prolific teacher, it would make sense that we know about him most through the people he influenced most, his students. Second, the vast majority of ancient writings are lost. Having extensive works in an ancient philosopher or writer is the exception rather than the rule. Also, quick aside with respect to the first point, at roughly the same time in human history, on the other side of the Eurasian continent, another great teacher and philosopher had his speeches and lectures compiled by his students. That individual was Confucius, who also arguably has no writings directly attributed to him, despite the monumental influence of his philosophy. Shinjuku Kabukicho Love Hotel Killings in 1981, Tokyo's Shinjuku and Kabuki-cho districts were the scenes of a series of chilling, unsolved slayings that have since become known as the Shinjuku-Kabuki-cho Love Hotel killings. The cases involved the deaths of three women, all strangled in love hotels, a type of short-stay hotel found in Japan that offers privacy for couples. The series of slayings only ceased after a fourth woman survived. The first known victim, referred to as Hostess A, was discovered strangled to death in March 1981. Found in a love hotel, she was initially believed to be a 33-year-old paid companionship provider based on the identification found on her. However, it was later revealed that her ID was fake and that she was actually a 45-year-old woman who was estranged from her family. The second victim, known as Hostess B, met a similar fate in April 1981. She was strangled with her pantyhose. Hostess B was thought to be around 20 years old and possibly Taiwanese, although her identity has never been confirmed. The third victim, Shujo A, a 17-year-old girl, was found in June 1981. Unlike the others, she was discovered alive, but later succumbed to her injuries in the hospital. A common thread in these slayings was the use of pantyhose for strangulation and the presence of stimulants in the victim's systems, suggesting they might have ingested the drugs orally, either by force or on consent. The similarities in the modus operandi led police to believe these crimes were committed by the same individual. The suspect was described as a young, well-dressed man, standing approximately five foot three, seen wearing black-rimmed glasses. Despite multiple witness accounts, for reasons which are unclear to me, a composite sketch of the individual was never created. Notably, no security cameras existed in the love hotels in question, out of concerns for the privacy of the patrons of the hotels. The Umibozu. The Umibozu, a mythical creature from Japanese folklore, has been a source of fascination and fear for centuries. This entity, whose name translates to sea monk, is depicted as a massive humanoid figure emerging from the depths of the ocean. Its appearance is characterized by a featureless, bald head akin to that of a monk and a body cloaked in darkness, sometimes described as covered in dark seaweed. Legends tell of its immense size often towering over ships, 
with some accounts describing it as larger than the vessels it encounters. Various traditional theories exist on what they are, suggesting that they could be the vengeful spirits of monks thrown into the sea or dragon deities demanding sacrifices. These beings are known to manifest during calm weather, suddenly causing storms to capsize ships or demanding barrels from sailors, which they then use to flood and sink the vessels. A peculiar way to fend off an umibozu involves offering a barrel with the bottom removed, which supposedly prevents it from sinking the ship. Since it will neither attack directly, and the barrels tossed back on the ship won't sink it. Historical and literary references to the Umibozu date back to the Edo period, with tales of its sightings contributing to the tapestry of Japanese maritime folklore. Recent sightings, such as the one reported in 1971 off the coast of Miyagi Prefecture, continue to fuel the legend of the Umibozu. In this instance, a fishing boat encountered a large, mysterious creature with gray-brown wrinkles and large eyes, which quickly disappeared into the sea. In my view, some Umibozu sightings may be explained by the phenomenon of rogue waves, which are unusually large and unexpected waves that appear suddenly in the ocean. These massive waves can reach heights of over 100 feet, often coming from directions other than the prevailing wind and wave patterns. This theory explains three elements of the cryptid. First, it explains the sheer size of the creature, dwarfing large vessels. Second, rogue waves are associated with calm waters rather than tumultuous oceanic patterns. The umabozu is said to strike when the waters are calm, causing ships to capsize. Finally, it provides one explanation for the habitat of the creature. While the traditional explanation is that the creature lives in the ocean due to its large size, it also suggests why there's never been a sighting of an umabozu in a river estuary or a bay. The 1458 Mystery Eruption In the mid-15th century, a significant volcanic event, now referred to as the 1458 Mystery Eruption, left a mark on the climate and history of the Earth, despite the volcano which caused it remaining unidentified. Historical accounts from Europe and Asia during the 1450s to 1460s describe unusual weather patterns, such as smog and haze in the skies, sun discoloration, and volcanic ash. These phenomena were accompanied by severe climatic disruptions, including increased precipitation, lower temperatures, famines, and property damage due to flooding and freezing conditions. The mystery eruption's impact was global, affecting crop quality, wine production, and exacerbating the hardships of medieval populations. The sulfur spike from this eruption, recorded in ice cores, suggests a massive aerosol cloud spread across the earth, altering weather patterns and contributing to the climatic conditions of the time. Ice core analysis has been pivotal in studying past volcanic activity, capturing particles and gases from eruptions and allowing scientists to trace their climatic effects. However, the 1458 eruption's specific source remains elusive, partly due to the challenges in correlating sulfur spikes in ice cores with known volcanic events. Initial hypotheses pointed towards the submerged Kuai caldera in Vanuatu as the source. Still, Recent studies, including the analysis of particles from Antarctic ice cores, have cast doubt on this theory. These studies suggest the eruption might have originated from a different, yet to be identified location. The reason for this being that the composition of the ash is rich in minerals not found in abundance in Kuwai. Atavia Flight 870. On the evening of June 27, 1980, a DC-9 aircraft, operating a domestic scheduled passenger service, vanished off the radar over the Tyrrhenian Sea near the Italian island of Ustica, plummeting into the dark waters below. All 81 individuals aboard perished in an event that has since been entangled in a web of theories, speculations, and government secrecy. At the heart of the Atavia Flight 870 tragedy lies the immediate cause of the crash, 
an in-flight explosion. However, the nature and origin of this explosion have been subjects of intense debate and investigation. Initially, mechanical failure was considered a potential cause, with investigators probing the aircraft's maintenance records and operational history for any anomalies. Yet no conclusive evidence of mechanical fault could be definitively linked to the catastrophe. As mechanical explanations faded, attention shifted towards more sinister theories, with a prevailing hypothesis suggesting that the aircraft was caught in a military skirmish and shot down by a missile. The Cold War era, marked by heightened military tensions in the Mediterranean, provided a volatile backdrop to this theory. There were reports of a radar sighting of an aerial engagement involving NATO and Libyan forces near the aircraft's flight path on the night of the crash. Adding credibility to the overall theory, Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi himself was traveling in the same airspace when this horrible tragedy occurred. This led to speculation that Itavia Flight 870 might have been accidentally struck by a missile intended for a military target or caught in the crossfire between military jets. Adding to the swirl of conspiracy theories were allegations that France had attempted to end Gaddafi on the night in question. However, despite various investigations, no evidence has conclusively proven this theory, and the French government has vehemently denied any involvement. In 2023, a former prime minister of Italy said, in a non-official capacity, that France shot the plane down accidentally. Another popular theory is that the plane was brought down by a bomb from an extremist group as part of a period of political violence in Italy known as the Years of Lead. Given the semi-official endorsement of the missile theory, I suspect this may prove to be correct. However, due to the sensitive nature of such an admission, this case will likely remain officially unsolved until long after everyone tangentially involved has passed away. Atlantis. Atlantis, a name that conjures images of an advanced civilization lost to the depths of the ocean, has fascinated historians, philosophers, and the general public for millennia. Its story originates from the works of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who mentioned Atlantis in two of his dialogues. According to Plato, Atlantis was a powerful and advanced kingdom that existed about 9,000 years before his own time, making its supposed timeline around 12,000 years ago from today. Plato described Atlantis as an island larger than Asia Minor and Libya combined, and located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, the term ancient Greeks used to refer to the Strait of Gibraltar. The island was said to be a paradise, rich in natural resources, and its people were advanced in technology and architecture. The Atlanteans were described as having a powerful navy, and their rulers were said to be the descendants of Poseidon. The heart of Atlantis was described as being concentric circles of land and water, with a magnificent palace in the center. The Atlanteans were depicted as virtuous people, living in a utopian society where peace prevailed and laws were just. However, as the Atlanteans grew powerful, they became arrogant. According to Plato, their moral decay led the gods to become angry, and as punishment, their island was submerged forever. The historical and geographical accuracy of Plato's account of Atlantis has been the subject of debate among scholars. Most scholars believe Plato's story was intended as a metaphor for the moral and political decline of his own society, rather than a historical account. Others have taken his descriptions at face value, proposing various locations for Atlantis with the most common location proposed being around where the Azores are located today. Another theory proposes that the story of Atlantis derives from the Ganchi people indigenous to what are now the Canary Islands. In favor of this theory, this was the only island-based civilization beyond the Pillars of Hercules that would have been known to the Greeks. In my view, it's abundantly clear that Atlantis was never intended to be a real place, but to be used as a teaching tool. That said, 
The idea that the Ganchi may have been used as inspiration for the idea is fascinating and adds new interest to what I had considered a stale, unsolved mystery. Man-eating trees. Stemming from tales as early as the 19th century, these plants were described with a horrifying appetite for human flesh. A notable story involves a naturalist in Central America encountering a vine-like plant, dubbed the Devil's Snare, capable of ensnaring and harming animals with its rope-like tissue. This plant was said to possess tiny mouths that would open to consume animal blood, but later investigations revealed these accounts to be obvious fabrications. Another famous example of the man-eating tree supposedly came from Madagascar. According to newspaper reports in the late 19th century, a German explorer ran across the Makoto tribe while traveling through Madagascar. While amongst the Makoto people, the German explorer noted that the tribe would perform sacrifices to the vegetational menace. The story gained further credibility and authority when Chase Osborne, the 27th governor of Michigan, wrote a book about the topic. Osborne's book, sensationalistically titled Madagascar, Land of the Man-Eating Tree, claimed he had spoken with Christian missionaries who were aware of the tree. However, there's one problem with this man-eating tree of Madagascar. The German explorer and the Makoto tribe never existed. The initial newspaper report was a fabrication, and all subsequent accounts were based upon this initial report. That said, belief in carnivorous trees still persists till the present, with some theorizing larger versions of things like the Venus flytrap exist and prey upon larger creatures. Why does the uncanny valley exist? The uncanny valley exists as a psychological defense mechanism rooted in our brain's intricate way of processing human-like entities. When robots or avatars nearly mirror human appearance or behavior, they trigger a primal alarm within us. This alert is not due to their similarity, but because they reside on the eerie threshold of almost human, yet not quite. This phenomenon, first identified by Japanese robotics pioneer Masahiro Mori in 1970, reflects our brain's method of distinguishing between genuine human traits and those artificially emulated. Studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging have pinpointed brain circuits involved in evaluating social cues and determining the eeriness of almost human agents. And as such, the phenomenon has a confirmed physiological basis in the human brain. However, the existence of the uncanny valley effect begs the question, why have humans evolved to be on guard around near human entities? What beings were we afraid of that made us select for this? One hypothesis is that this is proof of extraterrestrial entities visiting Earth during humanity's earliest years. Another hypothesis is that this evolved due to the existence of other near human hominids coexisting with humans and perhaps being hostile to humans. My hypothesis, which is less fascinating than the above, is that the uncanny valley may be common to all mammal brains as a way to assess differences between closely associated species. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I plan to make this the most extensive iceberg series ever but I can only do that if you subscribe. Also, check out the Patreon, my YouTube membership, and the Discord. Click the links in the description. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, and Kurt the Squirt. Until next time, stay healthy and peace out.